Hey, I'm Chris Zepp from Make Everything, and today we are gonna talk about the mystic art of drilling holes in steel. Now, I've made a video on this topic a couple of years ago, which you can check out right up here. And in that video, I went through a lot of different methods and sort of the basics, but there are a few things I wanna to add to that in this little supplement of some tips on drilling holes in metal. Now, today we're gonna go through making sure your holes are clean and straight, making sure you're drilling in the right location, some work holding tips, and a couple of other things that really help me be efficient when I'm drilling holes in steel. So let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Sunday Lawn Care, but more about that later. So first things first, I always like to start any sort of tip video around safety. It's the most important thing. If I teach you how to drill holes in steel, but you get wrapped up on your sweatshirt strings the first time you try to do it, you're gonna have a bad time. So I literally specifically wore this sweatshirt so that I could cut these strings off and show you that it's not worth it to risk kind of leaning over or leaning over a drill press and having one of these sucked in to the drill press. This hoodie in particular, at the very top of the hood, the strings are sewn in. So what does that mean? If you yank on this, this string isn't just gonna pull itself out. It's gonna keep pulling you. I'm pulling pretty hard. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna eventually rip my hoodie, but before that happens, it's gonna pull me closer to a sharp spinning bit. So let's go ahead and cut the strings off this hoodie if you're working in the shop. I personally find that tucking the strings in isn't really enough. Just snip them off, you're gonna be fine. Wear work clothes, it's okay. Now, this nice sweatshirt is a work sweatshirt. So on the topic of safety, one of the things that jams people up when they're trying to drill holes in steel is that what we call the helicopter effect. Basically, you're trying to drill a piece of steel and you're holding it in your hand and you think you've got a good grab on it. Then all of a sudden that drill bit grabs and that piece just goes flying. Now I'm working on a metal welding table right now and this is a really easy way to kind of fixture against it, but I'm gonna show you on the table and on the drill press how you can easily keep your metal from spinning out. All right, so here we've got a piece of quarter inch thick steel. Now this is a very typical kind of metal that a kind of home hobbyist or a small shop would be working on. And I wanna show you how if I try to drill a hole in this without any sort of fixturing, how I can get myself in trouble. So we're gonna drill a pretty standard quarter inch hole in this with a nice cobalt drill bit. I'm gonna talk a little bit about drill bits later on in the video. Let me show you what happens if I just do nothing. Right there, there's the danger zone. Now, what happens there is as the bottom of the drill breaks through the bottom of the material, it almost always creates a little uneven burr. And that burr is gonna grab the material and you saw how it spun this around. Now, using a hand drill, obviously I can just let my finger off the trigger and I can stop this thing from spinning. But if I was in a drill press, this thing would keep spinning around. Anyone that's ever tried to make a knife handle can talk about the helicopter effect. Now on my table, this spun around and eventually it, it hit this uh, bandsaw. But if you're working on a fixture table, something as simple as putting some pins in your table or some bolt heads or anything to kind of register this is gonna help avoid that. And obviously the best and easiest thing to do is just grab a clamp and put it on your material. Now that the material is clamped, I can finish up that hole and get it done. Now, similarly on a drill press, you're gonna want a vise. Uh, and there's a million different vices you can use, but I'm gonna show you one that I've been using lately that I really enjoy. So here we're at one of my small drill presses. This is a pretty standard run of the mill, uh, small shop drill press you'd put on a bench. And it's got a table with some holes in it that you could bolt a vise to. And that can be really convenient to bolt your vise down. The problem is, you know, you may want to drill a hole in a random location on this exact same piece of steel. And it might be hard to get this in a vise. So what people do is they'll try to get a clamp on these. And, and sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, what I have found can be helpful is just sticking a clamp on the table itself so that if this does go to spin, it has a positive stop uh, that it can't hit. But what I've been using lately that I really enjoyed is this fine magnetic base vise. And what's cool about this thing is by racking this handle, 
you get like a 30% grab so that you can move it around. And then by going all the way over, you get that 100% grab. And I'm moving the whole table uh, when I try to move this. So it's not for everybody. It's a, not a inexpensive tool. But if you do a lot of drilling, it can be really, really useful. And the jaws are very thoughtfully designed with a bunch of features cut in them. So you can grab round pieces and square pieces. And it has a little ledge so that you can put in material. But it looks like this plate that I wanted to drill is actually too big to fit in it. So we're going to drill uh, into this piece of 3 8 inch plate as an example of how you can use this on a drill press. So what you notice was as I was drilling, I was what's called pecking. So I'm drilling down and then I'm pulling back up. And when I pull back up, it generally pulls out a large chip. By pecking, it'll help break the chip that's being cut by the tip of your drill. And it'll just help you make a cleaner hole and not have all those chips swirling around, which could make sort of marks on the inside of your hole. Now to close up on the topic of safety and vices, you may have come across little drill press vices that look like this. These are excellent for holding material and they also allow you to get kind of a little extra grab if you're drilling, you know, a small piece of material if you want to drill something that could easily kind of spin on you or get out of your hands. The problem I found with these is they're hard to clamp. But what's excellent about them is that they're generally parallel on the side. So if you need to drill something and it's hard to clamp it, you can basically put something in this way and still drill it. If you want to drill like the end of a piece of tube, you can stick a piece of tube in there and then just have a nice easy way to kind of grab something. And again, you can easily throw a clamp on your table and try to hold this down. But invest in a good drill press vise for your own safety. You don't want that helicopter spin. And I'll do one more example of it so you can see what happens on a drill press. Now in this case, when this piece spins, it's gonna hit into the column. But if I didn't have the column, this thing could basically just spin around like a helicopter. So check it out. So you saw when that grabbed it, spun it right into the column. Now obviously, with a small drill bit, there's a lot less torque, but with a larger drill bit, these things can really get going. So make sure you hold on to your work. And I think needless to say, I have safety glasses on while I'm doing anything. So before we get to the next step, I wanna talk about this video sponsor, which is Sunday Lawn Care. Now my lawn at home is looking tired. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on the shop, but I also have to make sure that I take care of the house. Sunday Lawn Care has this incredibly easy and simple ordering process and website where you basically put in your address. It measures using satellite imaging how large your lawn is, decides how much product you need, bases your nutrient packs off of your geographical location, and these really simple and high quality nutrient dense packages with no harsh chemicals can help treat your lawn and make lawn maintenance and lawn care really easy and straightforward. It works with your lawn and with nature using the soil compositions that you have in your area to promote healthy grass growth, which is really gonna help me because I don't know a thing about the dirt or the lawn at my house. If you're having trouble or you just wanna have a nicer looking lawn for the spring and summer, I encourage you to check out Sunday and you can help support me by clicking on the link down in the description of this video. There's also a discount and promo code there, which I'll put on the screen right here that you can use to save yourself some money and get yourself on the Sunday lawn care program. Now that I have a new baby and she's gonna be outside crawling this summer, I'm really happy to know that I'm using a zero pesticide product on my lawn to help it look its best. So if you're interested, check out the link down below and thank you to Sunday Lawn Care for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to it. So you know how to hold your work so it doesn't spin and you probably have figured out how to drill holes in one piece of steel, but what if you need to make multiple pieces of metal with the same hole pattern? That's where transfer punches come into play. Okay, so we've drilled a couple of holes in this piece of steel, right? And now we want to transfer some of these holes down onto this other piece of steel. Now, 
you might think you can get away with taking a Sharpie and just sort of like, you know, tracing the hole and then you pull the metal away and you kind of look at it and you try to find the middle. And then you could take a punch and you could try to punch that center mark and maybe you'd get close, but there's a better way and it's with these guys. These are transfer punches. So if you look closely at the end, you can see there's a little dimple there at the end. And then this is an entire set that goes up through the 16th, I believe, all the way up to half inch. So basically what I can do here is I can line up, you know, one of my holes, figure out which of the center punches fits in between it, these transfer punches, and then I can go ahead and use this to punch through. And then I know I have the exact center of that hole. Now you can see this one in particular, this hole's a little too big for even the half inch center punch. And for a better example, I've got this vice base, which has some pretty large holes in it. And I'm gonna show you how you can use a different style transfer punch to actually get yourself a perfect registration on the center of this. So transfer punches aren't new to most fabricators, but you may have never seen a universal transfer punch like this. Now, basically what this is, is it's a little spring-loaded cone and what it allows you to do is basically center yourself over a hole and then by pressing down, it makes this shank perpendicular to the surface that you're pressing it against and then this is your punch. So on a hole like this, which is probably close to three quarters, I can use this little self-centering cone and then that plate, you can see that as I push down, it's squaring itself up. I can drop in that pin, give that a tap, and now I've got a perfectly centered registration hole at the bottom of this almost three quarter inch hole. And this can be used on a variety of sizes. I could even go back to my piece of plate here and I could center it up, make sure that I'm nice and square, give it a tap. And then I've got a perfectly centered hole through this. Now these are pretty inexpensive. And if you want to sort of carry one kind of transfer punch, you can use this in lieu of an entire set. The only thing I'll say about this thing is that it's a little cumbersome. And if you're in a tight spot, it can be really hard to use it because you have to be applying pressure in order to get it to square itself up because that is spring loaded like that. So, you know, with a regular transfer punch, I could be sideways, I could be upside down and I could still use these. With this, if I'm in a tight spot, it's gonna be hard for me to hold this, keep it square, grab a hammer, hit the punch and all that stuff. So I definitely think something like this is good to have, but it might not necessarily be the best for every situation. Also, this piece just slides through here. So um, you can easily misplace this piece uh, and I don't know what size it is or if it would be easy to replace. So on the other side of transferring through large holes, you have the optical center punch for really, really fine and really precise hole marking. So you are make sure that when you're drilling holes in a piece of metal, they're exactly where you want. Now I have two different styles here. They're essentially the same. And basically what they do is they have this little sight glass that has a crosshairs at the bottom. And what you're gonna do with that crosshairs, I switched over to a piece of aluminum because it'll be a little easier to see, is if I make a really fine mark, I can then put this over it and then I can use the crosshairs to precisely line up with that mark. Then what I would do is pull the sight glass out and then swap my punch over into that hole location. Then I could take a hammer and gently make a punch mark. Now, I'm not gonna be wailing on this. This is for a very precise hole location. But man, the accuracy that you can get with an optical center punch is really, really, really great. Uh, I'm gonna bring in a little bit closer so you can see what I'm seeing as I look through the optical part of the center punch. So here's the optical center punch as I kind of move it around the plate and you can see the crosshairs in the bottom of that plastic sight. Now there is a little Sharpie mark. You can see how it magnifies it. And then here's a punch that I already did. Now this is tricky to do with one hand, but basically you would pull that out, like I said, and then swap it in for the punch. And as long as you hold this down tightly, this has cork on the bottom, which is supposed to help it from wiggling, you will be able to hit the same mark. Now this one, instead of having a crosshairs, this one has a little circle 
with a dot at the center. This one's a little more precise and a little harder to line up, but also does an excellent job. You can see that circle down in there. So both of these do the same thing. There are many manufacturers of these, and these are great for really precise holes. So one of the sort of mysteries that I tried to debunk with my last video on this topic was that you don't need really special drill bits to drill holes in steel. Uh, most big box store drill bits will drill holes in metal. Um, unless you're using like a bracing bit that's specifically made for wood, your twist drills will work. That being said, a high quality drill bit is going to absolutely make a difference in terms of longevity, the amount of effort you have to put into drilling a hole, and how long it's actually gonna last. Lately, I've pretty much exclusively been using cobalt drill bits. Now, you may be familiar with the term cobalt from other tools, but cobalt drill bits in particular are so much better than the regular sort of high-speed steel or even some of the other compound drill bits that I've used. They're more durable than carbide and they just cut beautifully. These are the drills that I've been using lately. Uh, these are from Faird Abrasives. Now Faird has made drill bits in Europe for a really long time, but they were always in metric sizes and they just released a set, a couple different sets in American fraction sizes. These things are excellent. This is what I was using when I was drilling the holes before. And I wanna just show you what a good half inch cobalt drill bit can do to a piece of 3 8 steel. Now, normally I would drill a pilot hole and I would chase it out with this, but just to show how good these cobalt bits can be, I wanna show you what it's like to just drill with one pass, half inch through 3 8 So that took just a couple seconds and it absolutely sailed through that and left a really clean hole. So if you're drilling lots of holes in metal, invest in a good set of drill bits and I can't recommend these fared ones enough. I'll put some links down in the description as to where you can get these and a couple other types of sets that they just released here in the US. So in my last video on drilling holes, I talked about annular cutters. Now annular cutters are like little hole saws on steroids. They're typically used in a magnetic drill. They have a three quarter inch shank on the back with some flats. It's called a weld on shank. Now these are amazing when it comes to drilling holes in steel using a magnetic drill. And there are some adapters that you can use these in a hand drill, but not everybody has a magnetic drill. So they're not really applicable to all cases. And not all sizes are made in annular cutters. So what I always recommend that people go out and buy is an inexpensive set of these carbide hole saws. Now these are typically marketed for like drilling holes in electrical panels. They're not super high quality, but they really can help you punch larger holes in steel. Now there are a lot of other hole saw kits you can get, but what I do like about these in particular is that these are a one piece design. So versus having an arbor with threads and then a hole saw that threads on there, I found that when you're drilling holes in metal with those, they tend to rattle. These are a one piece design. Now, like I said, they're pretty low quality and I've broken many of these, but this set is inexpensive and it's pretty good to have around just for the occasion where you need to, you know, punch a two and an eighth inch hole through a piece of quarter inch you can do it pretty easily with these. So I'm gonna drill the largest hole size that I have through this piece of quarter inch plate so you can see how easily these things work. And I'll do it with a hand drill so you can see that you don't even need a drill press to use one of these. So I've got a piece of quarter inch thick steel here. I've got this carbide hole saw. I have this steel blocked up on some one, two, three blocks so that when I pop through, I don't hit my table. And I'm gonna go straight through this and uh, see how this does with a little 12 volt hand drill. I'm gonna use a little bit of tap magic as a lubricant, at least for the pilot. And then I'll come back for the track. So what I did there just to kind of talk through that was I didn't wanna press too hard because as soon as that pilot bit popped through, I could have slammed down, which would have broken these carbide teeth. So I was really gentle drilling the pilot hole. Now I'm gonna let a little track form, and then I'm gonna come back and put a little bit of drilling lubricant in there. I'm also gonna switch my drill to the slower speed.
So now part of my hole has popped through. I'm gonna switch my drill to high speed and basically just try to quickly cut what's left. So I've got a two and a quarter inch hole now through this piece of quarter inch steel. Not the most ideal way to do this. You should do this in a drill press, but if you're in a jam, you can use these carbide hole saws, one piece hole saws with a hand drill. Didn't take that long. And obviously it would have taken me a lot longer to do this any other way. Okay, so now that we've drilled this hole, there's a burr on it. So on the back side of the hole, there's basically just a little tiny raised up section of metal. Now it's not something that you can see very well, but you can feel it with your finger. And what I've got here is a deburring tool. Now, if you've never used one of these before, basically it's a very, very sharp angled blade. This one has a couple different profiles that are stored down here in the handle. And what you can do with these is you can cut that metal burr off using these little cutters. I'll show you how this works. Now I inadvertently drilled this hole right next to another hole. So I'm not gonna get that nice smooth wrap around, but this is a, a pretty inexpensive deburring tool that I picked up on Amazon. And I can basically swap out for different style cutters. And then once I get the one I want, I basically just roll this thing around and it will cut the metal and get rid of that burr and create a nice little shaving. Now, the action of the deburring tool kind of depends on the smoothness, smoothness of the hole. It's not always gonna kind of glide around it, but once you get it on a good path, it'll actually leave you a really nice, almost micro chamfered edge that you can run your finger across and avoid getting cut. And if you only have access to one side, you can still usually get this around the bottom side as well, depending on obviously the size of the hole, but you can use this on large holes, on small holes, whatever really you can get it into. And uh, a good deburring tool can really be a useful thing to help keep yourself from cutting your fingers and avoid having to use sort of the grinder in all these different scenarios. I like this one because it stores the extra cutters right in the base and because it's got this sort of telescoping handle that you can uh, extend. This is a Chavive. You can buy these on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. So you've drilled a hole in a piece of metal and you wanna use some flat headed hardware so you can get that nice flush hardware look. Uh, but how do you do it? So I wanna talk about countersinks. Now there are a couple different types of countersinks on the market. Uh, mostly the difference in them is the number of flutes. So the number of little uh, cutter heads on it. Now I personally like a single flute countersink for steel. I find that they give a more consistent countersink hole. But the problem is, how do you make sure that that countersink depth is consistent? Now, you can kind of try to do it by eye, which I'm going to share. But then I want to show you this contraption. This is an aircraft countersink. But first, let's use the traditional method. And I'm going to try to get that depth perfect. And I'll show you how finicky it can be. Now, again, this is the kind of thing that you could definitely do in a drill press. It's preferred to do in a drill press. But I just want to show you that you can do all this stuff by hand. So when you're using a countersink kind of manually like this, it's a lot of trial and error. Basically, you're going you're gonna to start cutting your countersink. You're going to back it away. You're going to kind of go back and forth until you get that perfect depth. So right there, I've got a pretty flush set on my hardware. And it took a couple of attempts, but I did get there eventually. So now I want to talk about this contraption. This is an aircraft countersink. So basically what this is, this is known in the aviation and manufacturing world, but I find that these are underused by metal workers. So what you've got here is you've got a little thread in countersink with a pilot that is the size of your hardware. So these are specific to whatever size hardware you're using. And basically you thread that on. And then what you've got here is you've got a 
rotating shaft that has a guide block on it. Now, if you've ever used one of these for woodworking, this might seem kind of familiar. So this is a pilot uh, depth stop countersink that you can buy from a company called Amana. And these are great for woodworking. They have a little two flute countersink and a little drill. And what this allows you to do is pretty self-explanatory, but you drill and then this collar stops so that your countersink doesn't go too far. This is the exact same principle, but designed for metal with a replaceable countersink. So this has a little nylon bushing on the end. And what you do is you loosen this collar here on the back and then you can go ahead and pull back on this retaining ring and then you can adjust the depth of your countersink using this threaded collar. Now it's a very simple product. Uh, it's very pretty self-explanatory. The only issue that I ever have found with these is that a lot of times these countersinks are 100 degrees as opposed to the 82 degrees, which is the normal angle on a flathead piece of hardware, but you can get 82 degree countersinks for these. Now these are not that expensive. The actual body is about 40 to $50. What's more expensive is the cutters. But if you know what side you're going to use for about a hundred bucks, you can get yourself set up with pretty much everything that you would need with one of these. So let me show you how nice and easy it is to get a consistent depth using this tool. And the way that you can set it is you can use a countersink hole that you've already set and use that as your guide, which I'm pretty much set at right now. So I'm gonna chuck this up in the drill. This is also gonna help me make my countersink nice and straight and consistent. So right away, that cut beautifully. Now what I can see is that my depth was not deep enough, but I'm almost there. So what I would do is I'm gonna clean out the chips from this thing, and then I'm going to loosen the collar, and I'm gonna set my actual countersink depth just a little bit deeper. And then I can go back and continue to drill out that hole. And you can likely hear it in the video, but basically once it reaches its depth, the pressure on the cutter relieves and the drill just runs at full speed. So now that is absolutely perfect, totally beautifully flush, and it's the exact right countersink. I'm gonna show you a close up of the difference between the hand done single flute hole and the one I just did with this guided cutter. So you can see the hand done single flute countersink hole is not perfectly round. It's a little bit oblong, it's a little uneven. Now compare that to the one I just did with the aircraft cutter and it is perfect. It has a beautiful clean track. And if I drop that hardware in there, it is perfectly flush. So now the beauty of this is that if I'm doing a delicate project, I know that I'm gonna get the exact same consistent countersink every single time while using this tool. The only problem I found with these is that they don't go very large. So the largest hardware that you can use with these is probably quarter inch, maybe a little bit larger, but you're not gonna get a aircraft countersink like this in a much larger size for larger hardware. That being said, I think every metal worker and even woodworker should have one of these so they can do consistent, perfect countersinks every single time. I'll put a link to where you can buy one of these in the description of the video. All right, so on the topic of hardware, what inevitably comes up if you're gonna drill holes in metal is how you're gonna tap threads in metal. And I've done a bunch of videos on different tools I have for tapping, but I get asked about this little adapter pretty often when I share it in video. So this is a 3 8 inch socket adapter for a tap. So you'll notice on the back of any tap, there is a square shank, which basically keeps the tap from rotating when it's held in a tap holder. What's inside this little kind of chuck is little jaws that will grab that square shank perfectly. And then by using this socket adapter on the end, you can get a really good purchase on it and it's not going to spin in the chuck. If you've ever tried to use a tap in a drill chuck, you'll notice once it starts to cut the threads, it typically will spin in the chuck because there just isn't enough torque on that three jaw chuck to hold it. So I'm gonna just 
quickly show you how you can power tap with a drill through a piece of quarter inch steel. Uh, this is a number seven drill in here, number seven drill bit, which is the size that you would do for a quarter 20 tap, which I have right there. Put a little bit of oil down, drill a quick hole, and then do a quick tap using the drill. So I drilled a hole. I'm gonna do a qu very quick light chamfer with a countersink so that that tap can start nice and easy. And then I'm gonna go ahead and use that adapter that I had set up on my drill. And I've had my drill on the high speed, but obviously we're gonna bring it down to the low speed if we're gonna be doing any tapping. Now the thing about tapping is that uh, this, this is a spiral flute tap. So it's actually made to be tapped under power. If you have a traditional tap, these will work really well too, but you're going to want to break the chip by going forward and reverse. So now we've got this hooked up to the drill. Now I'm just going to go nice and slow. And just like that, I've got a quarter 20 tap hole inside this piece of quarter inch plate. You can see there's a quarter 20 piece of hardware. This is the same piece of hardware that we were using when I did the countersink demonstration. Now I wouldn't be able to countersink and tap this in the same piece. You would never do that anyway, but there isn't enough material in this thickness uh, to get that. But anyway, you can see how nicely those threads got cut. All right, so here's a really valuable tip that has raised some controversy when I've done it in videos, but honestly, it's gotten me out of a lot of jams. So if I want to drill a quarter inch hole through this plate and I can get over it and I can lean my body into it, I'm easily going to be able to press this drill through this plate. But let's say I can only stand right here, which means this piece is far out in front of me and I just can't really get enough pressure with my arms fully extended to drill that hole. So what are you going to do? Now, if you have a magnetic drill, which I do, I could just get the magnetic drill and, and set it up and all I'd have to do is turn a lever like a drill press. But what if you don't have a magnetic drill? What if the part is so small that your magnetic drill can't get on it? Well, that's where this tip comes in handy and you get yourself one of these squeeze trigger clamps and you can use this and your drill to essentially make a little mini drill press. Now you're gonna want a piece of wood as a backer, but essentially what we're gonna do here is we're going to create a clamping scenario where your drill is being clamped by this squeezy clamp the trigger clamp in order to create downward pressure without you actually having to lean over it. So you can kind of get where I'm going here. So now I'm squeezing the trigger and I'm squeezing the clamp and it's starting to drill that hole. Now it's not ideal and perfect because the clamp only has so large of a throat and whatever, but I'm standing in the same place I was standing before. And if I squeeze the trigger and I start working in on this clamp a little bit at a time, I'm going to be able to drill the hole. So what I'm doing is I'm allowing the drill to drill and then I'm giving it a little bit of pressure and allowing the drill to do its job, clear the chips and then give it a little more pressure. You can kind of hear the motor surge every time I clamp it. Now these quick grip clamps provide a tremendous amount of pressure, more than you may realize and they have a lot of kind of spring and kinetic energy so you can see how it's still cutting even though it seems like I haven't squeezed it in a while. I'll squeeze it again a little bit and it's going to keep drilling. So once I feel like I'm close to the bottom of the piece of steel, I'm actually going to let off the trigger and I'm probably going to finish it by hand so that the clamp doesn't allow me to break the drill bit. Okay, so I'm through the material now. I'm gonna take the clamp off. My little block of wood can come out and then I can just finish up the hole. And just like that, I was able to drill a hole in that piece of steel without having to exert any hand force or shoulder force myself, just using the clamp and the drill, creating basically a little mini portable drill press. 
So there are actually a couple of products that you can buy that essentially do that same thing, but I don't have any of those. So uh, using the clamp trick, I've gotten myself out of a lot of jams with this, uh, especially when it comes to like countersinking or deburring a hole at a weird angle. Um, and this works very, very well. And most people have a trigger clamp. The only problem is if you have a large drill or a large um, drill bit, you gotta have a really long clamp. You can see I just barely kind of make it with this clamp, but it got me there. All right, so we've switched cheese this piece of plate, but I wanna go over one last thing, which is how to give yourself an easy drilling guide to actually drill straight and square holes to your material using one, two, three blocks. So one, two, three blocks, at least these ones in particular, these have some threaded holes in them. Now these threaded holes are sized for three eighths 16 bolts, which is great if you want to bolt something to them, but the other holes are not through sized for 3 8 hardware. So what you can do, uh, one, two, three blocks are really great to have around your shop for a myriad of reasons. One reason is they're perfectly ground square in every direction, so you can use them essentially as little squares. So what you can do is you can use them in this orientation or in this orientation to get a perfectly square reference corner that you can then butt a drill up to to make sure that that drill is gonna go down perfectly square and perpendicular to the material. So if we, if we turn these on their side, they're two inches tall, which is the perfect height to use as a guide to make sure that this drill bit is going to go perfectly square down into this material. Now it's hard to clamp all these together, but what you can do is you can take a 5 16 bolt and you can run it through the through holes in the one, two, three blocks and just put a nut on the end so that you have one less thing to try to tighten. You can obviously do two or three of these and then you can get this nice and square if you get that nice and tight. Then from here, if you clamp this assembly down in the corner with one clamp, from there, you have a perfectly square reference corner that you can run a drill bit up against to get a nice perpendicular drilled hole in a piece of material. If you have a couple of one, two, three blocks, you can use them to check the squareness of this assembly by just basically referencing against it, making sure that everything is sitting nice and flush and nice and square. And then from there, you can kind of make your adjustments and now I've got a perfectly good reference corner that I can then take my drill and I can butt it up against it. And as long as I don't let it walk out on me, it's going to drill perfectly square against that corner. As long as I don't let it walk away, it's gonna drill perfectly square against that corner. Because these are hardened, the drill bit's not gonna do anything to affect that surface. All of the sharp and, and really effective cutting area on a drill is here at the tip. So I've got a nice square perpendicular to my base material hole, just using these one, two, three blocks as a little guide. If you don't already use one, two, three blocks in your shop, they're very inexpensive, they're great to use. Don't let anybody tell you that they're only for machining. I use them for welding, fixturing, propping stuff up. They're awesome and essentially at the price they sell them for, they're almost disposable. All right, that does it for this video. I hope these additional little tips and tricks on drilling holes in steel and what you can do once you've got those holes was helpful. I encourage you to go check out the original video that I made on drilling holes in steel because it covers a lot of other items, but this answers a lot of questions that I got from that video and questions that I get from my Instagram all the time. Uh, check out the Faird Cobalt drill bits and the other M2 drill bits, the other compounds that they've created and launched here in the US. I'm super excited to have these. I've always liked their metric drill bits that they had over in Europe and having these in fractional sizes here is just awesome. They're a really high quality bit and that sometimes does make the difference when you're looking for a longevity and a high quality clean cutting bit to save yourself some time. So if you have any questions about anything I did here, please leave them down below. All the links to all the tools that I used here will be down in the description as well. And please check out the sponsor of this video, Sunday Lawn Care, and use my code MAKE25 to save yourself some money if you're interested in trying out that system on your home. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.